Tana Koto Katoa. Welcome to all who have joined us for tonight's webinar. The days are certainly getting shorter and colder. Hopefully everyone is somewhere warm and dry this evening as we welcome tonight's speaker. His name is Tavi Saniyaki. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Tiff, Tiff, that's it. <laughs> you go, you Tiff graduated it. in 2005 in London. Then after a couple of years working in England, he moved to New Zealand and pursued specialty training in radiation oncology, obtaining fellowship of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Radiologists in 2015. A fellowship in palliative radiation in Toronto in 2018 preceded him taking up a permanent consult posi consultant position in Dunedin Hospital. His subspecialty interests are head and neck, breast, lung and palliative radiotherapy. He enjoys teaching and is currently Director of Training for RENZCR Radiation Oncology Registrars in Dunedin and an honorary clinical senior lecturer at Otago University. He is married and has two young children who might pop in and say hello at some point, <laughs> and two young cats under a year old each. Um, before I hand you over, just to say, use your chat function to introduce yourself, and if you use your Q&A tab for any questions along the way, I'm sure we can get to those at the end of the presentation as well. I'll now hand you over for this evening. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. That was lovely. I feel really good about myself now, so thanks a lot. Um, so hopefully you can hear me nice and clearly. Um, I know that for some of you, although I feel great, you may not feel necessarily that great because you've got an hour of radiation oncology with me. Um, and um, I, I know that for people outside the field of radiation oncology, that can sometimes be daunting. And my job especially as a, a director of training for, for newbies, is to try and make radiation oncology a bit more accessible. Um, in every field, there are minutiae within it that people don't really need to know about and doesn't help people. So this is uh, essentially made to hopefully be accessible for you and be useful for you in your practice. I know there are lots of doctors here, there are lots of nurses on here and other people in the community um, that may have patients under their care uh, that have had radiation, that may be going for radiation and maybe just being more familiar with this will be useful. Um, I've not done this talk to, this, to, to, to you as a group before, um, so I don't necessarily know exactly what your needs are. I have talked to a couple of GPs already. But please, I'm sure you will give me feedback. I, I really do encourage it. I really do want feedback. Um, if you have questions in the midst of this, please do go ahead because I will um, answer them as I go along. If you want to ask me questions at the end, that'll be fantastic. I also haven't run through this specific talk um, as it is before, so I don't know how quick this is going to be. It may be a half an hour chat or it may be well over an hour. <clears throat> and... Um, so if we if it's short, we can do questions for longer. If it's long, I've put a timer for myself and in the last 10 minutes, we can do some questions. So let's get going. So the overview, um, we're gonna look through some teaching goals. What's the purpose of why we're we doing this today? Um, I'll give you a general introduction, which we kind of have already had about myself. I'm gonna talk about the department um, and give you an overview just so you know what my department looks like for you. I mean, your departments are all different out there and there's a huge uh, group of you. Um, we are very limited and specific. There's only two radiation departments in the whole of the South Island. Um, but I've got some pictures of what it looks like just to familiarize yourself um, to help your patients. Some basic principles of radiation. Again, um, I, I, I'm sure a lot of you are extremely intelligent. But um, when it comes to radiation, it's, it's a matter of really seeing it. Um, and um, if you haven't, it doesn't make any logical sense. And I, and I know that because I was once a non-radiation trainee and I didn't know anything about it until I got into it. Um, I can probably say that my colleagues in medical oncology who work hand in hand with us, um, at least some of them wouldn't actually know what happens to a patient when they come into our department. They come in, they get radiated, and they come out the other end. And what happens in the midst of that um, um, can be a bit of a mystery. 
I'll show you a little bit of the patient and treatment journey. It's kind of the workflow, what happens to a patient and the workflow for me as a radiation oncologist. Now that's um, maybe useful for you. It's not like I can recruit you. You already have jobs, unfortunately, but that's how it is. Um, side effects. Again, it may be that a patient comes to you and wants to understand what the side effects are, or they may ask you and they're worried about it. And, and you have such a connection with your patients, even before they see me, you might be able to allay some of those fears or not. Um, but I'll give you a, a relatively simple way of working out what the side effects are going to be. There's no point learning big lists. Um, what kind of supports a patient has during the, the journey through our department and after? Um, patients under the hospice care, many patients that we have obviously have a connection with the hospice and palliative care services. And so I'll mention a little bit about that. And I deal with head and neck cancers and they're some of the most difficult um, treatments that we deliver to patients. Uh, and so I'll just, I just have a slide on that. And then finally, I have some common questions that patients ask that I've written out, but of course you'll have time to ask me things as well. So teaching goals, <coughs> pardon me. Sorry, I do have a cough as well, so apologies. I'm COVID negative, so don't worry, you can't get COVID through the screen. Um, and I gather there's a lot of rhino virus around, so that's what I have. Um, if you have a remedy, please let me know in the question and answer section. Teaching goals. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'd like you to be familiar with the kind of staff. So I've got pictures of our staff. Um, sometimes it's nice to have a, a face to a name. So I've got pictures of the consultants. There's only five of us. You've, you've seen our letters. You've talked to us probably, pro probably over the phone. Um, we, we might meet in the future. Um, to gain some knowledge, so it's easier to inform your patients, um, to be able to answer some qu simple questions that they may ask you, um, and who to contact for you or the patient if you have any questions. So that's me, you've already got the introduction, that's my best picture I have. Um, so a quick department overview. I, I took this picture today because I, I suddenly thought, oh, I don't have a picture of the front entrance. I'm sorry, it's quite gray, as you know, Dunedin Hospital's fairly gray. We are, and that's in the courtyard. It's not in the main building. It's just in the courtyard next to it, next to the emergency department. And if you park under the hospital, we are just a level up. That's the main entrance at the moment. Um, um, and I don't know whether you can see my arrow. Kath, can I? Can they see my arrow? Do you think? Yeah, you can. Um, so this is our building here in the corner. Um, across the street is New World. If you know Dunedin Centre at all, and so. The machines, actually, the bunker, this is the bunker, this lock here, behind these, this wall are three linear accelerators. That's what this is. Three machines are stacked back there. I'm pretty sure that's where they are. Um, I'm just trying to work out from the inside of my building. Um, and so in the, in the daytime, you don't really want to walk on here because that's when you'll be radiated. And so these people are probably a little infertile. Um, I'm only joking, by the way. They're completely shielded. Don't worry. It's completely safe. It's always tested. Um, this is our machine and a group of our team. Um, we are part of the radiology um, college. So it's both radiation oncology and radiology. Of course, we do very different things. Uh, radiologists just doing the diagnostic imaging and reading those images that we all know. As a radiation oncologist, we do scans and we, we, we look at scans all the time. But we don't produce any reports on those scans, but we use them and uh, you know, use them to plan our radiation and then use radiation to treat cancers and benign things as well. <clears throat> so I, I suspect some or all of you have met some of these people before. So these are the radiation oncologists. Um, when I started in December 2018, um, there was only Dr. Costello, Dr. Kelly and John North there. And they had been there, to my knowledge, for many years before that, really keeping the department afloat. Um, you've probably read in the ODT all of our problems. And that's really because it's been only those three people keeping it afloat for so many years. And now it's really got to the point where we need to double our department in size. And finally, someone's going to have to pay for it. Um, Sean is the, the um, clinical lead of the department. 
Um, these pictures, by the way, they didn't provide these pictures other than David. I got these off the internet, but I didn't ask them. It was already there. Um, Sean's pictures from his um, Mercy private, he does private clinics. And so he's a little bit bolder than that now, um, probably bolder by about half, if that makes any sense. Um, I'm allowed to say that because I'm completely bold myself, so that's fine. But Sean is head of department, and he's also got his hands in um, in the college and the ministry as well. So he's got connections. Dr. Lyndall Kelly, um, who actually is planning to retire next year. Um, she's in the department and she's my colleague that does head and neck cancers. Um, she's been on the hospital board now for a year making changes. And so, you know, there are some quotes from her on the ODT. Um, about uh, the, the disasters that we've had in the, the department. So um, she's been, she essentially had enough and um, um, I think she got on the board so that she could actually make some changes, which is great. John Nott's been in the department for decades to my knowledge and uh, he's a workhorse. He essentially sees prostates and uh, gynae and rectal cancers. And then David, David actually joined after I did, which kind of within six months in 2019. He's from South Africa um, and he comes across with his two little kids. And so he deals with um, he deals with CNS and breast cancers and lymphomas um, and prostate cancers. So this is what it looks like. This is an old building. Um, as you know, there's a build, uh, there's a new build for the new hospital. We're actually not part of the new build. That would be a whole lecture to talk to you for another hour one day. Um, we're going to remain in this building till till 2035, I think. So I, I don't know. But our patients will be in the new hospital. So I, I'm not entirely sure how that's going to work. Um, but we'll figure that out in the next 15 years. This is the front desk. Um, there's no one in the department when I took these pictures the other night. It was nighttime. Um, but this is what is presented to the patients as they come through. There's a small wait area. The chairs have been moved around because of COVID, and then they've come kind of back together again. And there's a long corridor. At the end of that corridor are your um, machines, which I'll show you a little bit about. And you've got some outpatient rooms. They look like any other outpatient department, I guess. This is our biggest clinic room, and it has a bit of space for far now and uh, patients and, and students, et cetera. Um, this is the draw. You can try and guess which part of the team this is. Um, this is actually from a, a physics lab laboratory. We have physicists in our department, and um, I don't believe there are any physicists on this talk today, so I can say what I like. But um, they, they, um, they probably um, uh, they have a tendency to to hoard electronics. I think that's fair. Um, there, there are pros and cons to that. If you lose anything electronic, then you know where to find uh, a replacement. Um, so that's that's really my pictures of my department. Um, and so hopefully we we meet some of you at some point and, and you know our faces. I put a few numbers together as to what our department is made of, again, to give you a, a, a feel of the scale, I guess, of, of what we're dealing with. And you can compare it to your own departments and what you've worked in in the past. So there are five radiation oncologists. Um, I will say that we're trying to recruit another four. So we really want to be at around eight or nine for it to be a, a functional department. Um, we've got two registrars and we've had one registrar forever until this year. And actually, as of today, we've been accredited for two more registrars. So as you can tell, with all the troubles, we, we're, we're being able to recruit, which is great. There are about 50 radiation therapists. I might, that might be a slight overestimation. <clears throat> but so radiation therapists, their, their job um, it's quite varied, and so there are therapists that work on the machines, helping patients get into the perfect position, and there are, <coughs> excuse me, um, planning therapists, the ones that actually put plans together, and then sometimes in unison with physicists, they, they get those out. Um, and so they are quite, they're, they're, they're by far the biggest group. Um, we have six physicists, again, we're planning to double that number. Uh, uh, Many people are scared of radiation oncology as a 
from a training perspective when they're early in their career, probably because they're worried about physics. And the truth is that I don't have to care about physics because I have physicists and all departments do. So it's a bit of a, a misconception in many ways. The physicists are the ones that uh, they do many things again, but a, a big part is to make sure our machines are accurate and uh, keeping it accurate, really. Um, we have two cancer nurse specialists, CNSs. One of them is Verinia, who I believe may be on this uh, talk today. I think she's listening somewhere. I, I did remind her, um, and I said that I'll mention her name and maybe force her to say something, but I won't. Um, and we have three or four general nursing staff that come through our department, uh, general in the sense that they, they maybe one sticks around, but there's two or three that rotate around being at other sites and they probably in oncology. So they go up to the day ward and they come to the ward and they come in and join us for a number of months that ago. And so we have seven or eight admin staff at the front, well, I showed you the front desk, and we have other, other teams that join in. Um, they're not um, solely ours. So we have some psychologists, as you can imagine, our patients need psychological support. And particularly for head and neck cancers, we have dietitians, although all cancers, but di dietitians, speech and swallow therapists and dental teams. So they are the allied health groups that do their own work outside of oncology, but also join us. And a bit to give you a, a bit of scale of um, the, the kind of treatments that we provide and what that means, we have three linear accelerators, excuse me. A linear accelerator is your modern machine that delivers radiation. Um, and I'll show you a picture of one, one of those. Three linear accelerators is probably the minimum, <coughs> excuse me. Um, it's probably the, we're probably the smallest department in the country. Um, each machine delivers between tw 20 to 30 treatments per machine per day. So we're talking about patients being put through that machine. So we'd treat anything between 60 and 90 patients a day on average. And it takes around 20 to 30 minutes uh, to, to deliver a treatment of standard complexity. Now that might change you know, the quickest might be 10 minutes and the longest might be a couple of hours, depending on what we do. Um, but as a very general number, 20 to 30 minutes. And usually within those 20 to 30 minutes, the machine is only really on for only about two to four minutes. So that's going by, say, a, a, a simple breast treatment, um, treating just the breast by itself or even with nodes, maximum of four minutes of actual machine on time. All the other minutes is getting parked up, walking into the department, getting changed and getting into position and making sure that position is perfect to what we had planned that treatment on. Um, and finally, the number of patients we see, on average, that's between two and 300 new patients per year per consultant. So that's roughly what we get through. So um, I believe per year we're getting through about 1,200 patients to, through our department, something like that, as new patients. Now, that doesn't count um, retreatments, which, of course, the patients live through their treatment and come back with metastatic disease. And um, in some ways, probably a third of everything we do is palliative treatment. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, those clinic rooms, we only have six clinic rooms, outpatient clinic rooms, and that's shared between medical oncology and hematology. Um, COVID has meant that some of the clinics that we do are um, remote, which, which actually has helped our space issues. We do take turns going down to Invercargill, and so once a week, one of us will see some patients there. Um, and one of the consultants, uh, Sean actually goes to Balclutha, I'm not sure, once a month maybe, um, to see some patients there too. Ward 8C, so this is our uh, medical, this is our oncology ward in the hospital. Um, again, I asked Verinia how many beds we have up there, and actually it shocked me that it's only 14 beds, and that's shared between radiation oncology, hematology, and medical oncology, um, which seems um, um, way too little, um, and I don't believe that they're planning to increase the number of beds when we move to the new hospital, which is a bit shocking. Um, radiation 
it's mostly an outpatient treatment, um, mostly because the side effects are usually well tolerated and they don't really turn up overnight. So there's time to preempt them and support them before there are any major problems. And so quite often there are no patients on the ward. That is a, that is that does happen. Um, we, we average maybe two to four and we can go up to maybe nine or 10. So two weeks ago, we had about nine patients on that ward. And so that takes up more than half the beds just for radiation. And I'd say that hematology and medical oncology um, historically tend to have more complex side effects uh, from patient for patients. And so they end up in the ward. <clears throat> um, there are only four nurses in the morning shift, three in the afternoon and two overnight. So these nurses are really pushed to the limits on the ward. When the strike went out a couple of weeks ago, the emergency staffing that happened on the ward was actually more than they have on a regular basis, which is bizarre. <laughs> All right, hopefully that makes sense. So I'm gonna give you some basic principles and a little bit of history from radiation. Um, I'm hoping I'm going at a reasonable pace for you. Um, and you can understand it all, sweet. Um, so I'm not going to go into this in crazy detail, but the radiation forefathers really start with um, at least these three, probably more, Mr. Röntgen, Becquerel, and Marie Curie. Um, most, if not all, will know some of these people. Uh, Röntgen was a physicist, a scientist, and he, he essentially discovered X-rays. And he... Um, I think maybe he even coined the term X-ray, or maybe that, yeah, I think he may have even coined the term X-ray. Um, Becquerel was a physicist. This is around 1895, um, a turn, turn of the 19th century. Um, Henry Becquerel, along with Mary Curie, was also a um, physicist that had heard about X-rays and they did their own experiments. Uh, Marie uh, ended up coining the term radioactivity, and she also um, had two Nobel Prizes in physics at different times, and so that was pretty darn spectacular for a, a woman of her time to get that. I don't think she was even, I don't think women were even allowed to have Nobel Prizes at that point, so she, she did something absolutely amazing. She provided, um, or she made, um, remote X-ray machines for the troops in World War One, um, and she she also discovered a number of radioactive materials. So she was clearly uh, amazing. This is apparently the first X-ray. It was actually off Mr. Becquerel. Sorry, not Becquerel. Mr. Rengen's wife. Um, and the legend goes that um, he made her have an X-ray, and she didn't know what it was all about. And then she saw the picture, and then she screamed and said, I've seen my death, because of course they'd never seen an x-ray before, and it was ghastly to her, and apparently she never came down to the lab ever again. That's the story, and it says, I think it's 1895, it says it somewhere. Um, a lot of radiation, radiation's past has uh, really come from disaster in some ways, uh, and not really understanding the the dangers of radiation, and for some people, that still remains quite a stigma and a and, a, and an issue. Without education, knowing what we do is safe and understood when it didn't used to be, um, and some some of these stories really do play a part. And I've certainly had um, um, Eastern European patients who, who who just can't have radiation because of their connection to Chernobyl and other disasters. <clears throat> this this is a picture, uh, some of you may know, um, I think they were called uh, the Radium Girls, I think is what they were called. It's 1920s, probably. Um, and this is a, a, a group of women who were, and they were all women, because, of course, men couldn't do this job back in the 1920s. They were, they were employed to um, put on radium onto the dials of clocks, because, of course, it, gl it, it glowed in the dark. And they were trained to take the end of their horsehair um, brushes and put it in their tongue to make a perfect little point at the end. And as you can imagine, they, they, they essentially radiated their, their oral cavities. And it was, they were told that it was completely safe. Um, they, they would go home, they would paint their nails and their teeth and all sorts of things because it was fun. Um, at the time, the company actually knew that there were some dangers for this. And so the higher up management would have all safety equipment, but not the staff. And it's probably one of the biggest um, occupational um, 
misadventures that have happened in time. Yeah. Okay, we'll get to uh, present day in two slides. So this is uh, slide number one, 1940s, 1950s. This is what the machines used to look like when my retiring colleagues um, used to treat things. And so this is called an orthovoltage machine. <clears throat> Essentially, the difference with our machines now are that they are mega voltage, they have more energy or they have more energy in the radiation. And, and what, why does that make a difference? Because when you have, as a, again, as a general rule, when you have more energy, um, it pushes the dose under the skin surface. It has this ability to skin spare. And part of the problems with the old treatments are that your skin used to get very um, red and broken down, and that used to be the limiting factor. So when people remember horrendous reactions back in the day, it's because their machines really weren't, I guess, powerful enough. Um, and, you know, you have maybe other team members, surgical team who've had patients come through the radiation department, and some of them still say, oh, my gosh, you know, the radiation reactions are going to be terrible. And they remember the bad old days, and that's just how it was. Um, there was a limiting factor with the, the power of those machines. The machines we have now look like this. This is from our Electro brochure. This is exactly the machine that we have in our department. It's all shiny and, and beautiful. Um, and so these are mega voltage machines. I'll show you a picture of ours and how, it, maybe not how it works, but how a patient gets on it and, and where the radiation comes from. And <clears throat> just to say that when we deliver the radiation, this is just a fancy picture of, probably not an accurate picture of DNA, just pretty. Um, but the target of the radiation is really the DNA within the cells. And it, it damages that in a, in a couple of ways. It damages that either directly um, causing damage to the DNA double strand. It can do other things. Uh, it could damage just one strand. It can do base damage. It can uh, pull apart the, the strands, really anything. But the the, the most uh, relevant damage, that means that a cell might go on and die, tends to be a DNA double strand break. So there's direct effect when the radiation hits the DNA. And then there's an indirect method where it has a, the radiation has a reaction within the water that makes free radicals. And those free radicals in the water, if you know about free radicals, they are um, energetic species that like to do nastiness. And so they go around and they damage the DNA in that way. And so, uh, probably with our most common type of radiation that we use, which is photons. Again, you don't have to remember any of this, but photons is probably the indirect method that causes most damage. Um, and having damaged DNA, so this does it, the radiation doesn't necessarily choose which cells it's going to damage. It just does what it does. We, um, we select where that radiation is going using all our tools, and I'll talk a bit about our tools too. When the DNA is damaged, it doesn't mean that the cell is definitely dead. For instance, in normal cells, you have a number of different single strand and double strand repair mechanisms. So some of your normal cells will actually repair. Hence why having treatments on different days makes sense, because as you do a treatment one day and then you have a bit of time before you go to the next, that's actually the time when you have the non-lethal uh, cell damage repair happening. Tumors are really good at replicating, but less good at repairing. <clears throat> and so the time the cell dies when the DNA is damaged is when it tries to replicate because the DNA doesn't line up properly and everything falls apart. So that works out for really selecting more of the cancer cells that die versus the normal tissues. That's probably all I'll say about that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about units of radiation because you will receive the um, discharge letter, which is just an automated printout from our machine once they're done. And it'll say this patient has had this amount of radiation, uh, goodbye and good luck. And so um, maybe just knowing what that means in general terms would be useful. Again, I'm sorry if you already know this. Um, the unit that we use of radiation in, in essentially all departments is, is the gray, G-Y, um, G-R-A-Y rather than G-R-E-Y, if you wanted to spell it. Um, and it essentially is a, a unit of dose that is deposited in tissues. That's all it is. And we have <clears throat> different courses for patients. And so you'd see curative courses and palliative courses. 
again, I'm, I'm into giving you kind of ballpark averages because I can't tell you everything here and there's always things outside the average. But curative treatments range in the kind of 50 to 75 gray range. And palliative treatments might be anything as low as four to 30 gray. And that might be delivered in anything like a single fraction for a small number, small amount of gray to multiple fractions. Fractions just mean a division and they're usually given daily. So if I said 20 gray in 10 fractions, that means that those 20 gray is divided by 10. So it's two gray per day till you reach 20 gray. Um, in palliative terms, so in curative terms, I'll say that the dose of radiation is there to essentially kill off all the cells that you have. And of course, if you have more cells, you need more radiation. In head and neck, for instance, if you have a macroscopic tumor, a lump, then you need to give more dose to that lump. Um, you might give a smaller dose to high-risk microscopic disease, so a zone in, say, the lymphatic drainage of that tumor. And then if there's a second you know, or third area that you're worried about that is of less risk, you might give a lower dose to that area. So the amount of radiation, it's just a probability thing. The more you give, the more likely you are to kill cells. When we're talking about palliation, that, that um, balance has changed now because you want to provide palliation of symptoms, but you don't want to give side effects. So you're trying to give this treatment in as short a space as possible. You want to alleviate the side effects and give minimum, um, sorry, you want to alleviate the symptoms and give minimum side effects. And so that is a, a bit more of a finer tune. These are just some of the doses. Again, just for breast cancer, we use 40 gray in 15 fractions. This won't mean much to you. I'm just giving you ballparks. For my head and neck cancers, we give 70 gray in 35 fractions. In rectal cancers, we give 50 and 25. So sometimes, as you can see, we give it in two, two gray per fraction per day. That's what I mean. Like the 50 and 25 and the 17, 35. In breasts, it used to be 50 and 25. And then the studies came out that we can do it faster. But it means that each day we give a slightly higher dose. And it essentially equates to the same amount of cell kill as we used to be able to give um, in a longer course. You don't need to know that. I'm just saying that that's, those are the kind of numbers. Um, a lot of people will know radiation in the form of radiation exposure. And I've got a couple of slides about that. Some of you might be interested about it. I know some patients are interested about it. Um, and also it gives you a bit of perspective of what we're doing. This is a, a lovely picture I found um, two days ago um, from this journal. There's a title in the corner there, and it has a map of Hiroshima. And there are two areas there. There's a darker patch in the middle, which is apparently the area where there was total destruction from uh, the, um, the, the center of the Memorial Park, which is right next to there. And there's some uh, partial damage around the corner. And as you can see, the, there's a scale at the bottom here of just a kilometer. And within that probably two kilometer, um, 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 I'm sorry, one kilometer radius, um, they look at exposures above, above two gray being an issue. And then very quickly over the next one to two kilometers, that, that drops down very quickly. But as you can see, this is this is the area that was to totally destroyed. So this is a very important part. And to go with that, um, having more than two gray exposure, um, when they look at people who've died directly from that or from second cancers that die from it or other um, problems, it's more than 50% of people die if you have an exposure above two gray. That's, that, that might sound alarming when you just looked at the numbers of gray that we're giving patients. Um, <laughs> and that's not the number of patients that die in my department, though, uh, from my treatment at least. Um, one to two gray and then below. Um, and then again, I'm, I don't actually read The Guardian, but they had this in there on their website, which was quite nice. Um, a lot of people wonder about radiation exposure in, in the community. I, I think some people don't really think about it. It's, it's measured in something called millisievert, which is the, the unit that's used for exposure, uh, particularly for safety. And uh, there's a way of, there is a way of converting it roughly. And so 10,000 roughly is 10 gray and 1,000 is roughly one gray. So going right to the bottom, you know, dental x-rays are tiny, one gray, and that's a, a tenth, a hundredth of a, a gray, which is, which is good. Is that correct? And yeah, that, 
no, no, I take that back. Uh, thousand, sorry, I can't even work it out in my head. It's it's very small. There you go. Very safe. Um, as you go up, um, we get to, there you go, that's about a hundred at two zeros. There you go, a hundred of a gray is a full body CT scan. Um, now have a look here. If you go on a long haul flight, um, the airline crew annually gets about nine gray. So they almost get uh, the, the same as a full body CT scan because they get cosmic radiation. So every time you go out in your plane, uh, you, you get radiated because the atmosphere protects you from cosmic and solar radiation to a, an extent. Um, the same when they fly right across, you know, they usually fly across the North or South Pole to try and minimize the time and distance. And so you have uh, a thinner magnetosphere up there that um, has less protection. And so you get radiated a little bit more. So the crew of airlines, wear, they, they wear the same badges that we have to check how much radiation exposure they've had. Um, and so uh, radiation workers down here, Fukushima and Chernobyl are here, which are about a, a half a gray or less. So a single gray um, causes radiation sickness, but not death. If you get five gray, um, would kill about half of people within a month. Six would be um, in Chernobyl, at least the workers, but it says typical dosage recorded by Chernobyl workers who died within a month, and 10 is fatal within weeks. Now, you're probably thinking, well, in my department, I think that the biggest dose we give is probably 90 gray in a single fraction, nine zero in a single fraction. We give it for trigeminal neuralgia, so not even a malignancy. And sometimes these uh, benign things actually are more resistant because the cells aren't turning over like cancers are. And so you, you have to give really big doses. Um, but but why do we get away with it? And it's really the the volume effect and the fractionation effect. So and probably more, most of the volume effect. When we're talking about exposure and deaths from these things, such as in this chart, we're really talking about exposure to the whole patient. Um, and, and, and that makes a big difference um, on, on killing, I guess, stem cells and important um, supportive cells throughout your body, where when we um, treat a very small um, area, um, the surrounding tissues can support that and 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 really it's not fatal um so we we might make you have an ulcer for instance if we give too many too much radiation to one spot if we kill all of the stem cells that would regenerate in that area um mo most often it just means delayed healing because the stem cells surrounding that wound would just grow in from the side it just takes longer um but yeah, patients don't really die from the radiation we give unless we put that ulcer in the wrong place. If we put that ulcer in a, a blood vessel, for instance, and they bleed out and they die, but you're not gonna die from radiation exposure as such. The other part is that fractionation thing. So if I give 70 gray to my head and neck cancers, uh, it's done sequentially over 35 treatments. And so, as I mentioned, between each of those fractions of radiation, they're getting some repair of those tissues. But if you gave it in one block, they probably would die if it was to the whole head and neck, but that's just not what we do. Right, patients and treatment journey. Okay, we're running through time. I need to speed up a bit. So once they see us in treatment, they get a CT scan. This is our CT machine. It's exactly the same as the one in radiology, but we have our own machine. Um, there are a couple of aids to keep the patient in the perfect position, um, to help them get into the perfect position. And then when they come to treatment, they have to be in that exact same position so that we're to the millimeter pinpoint accurate. Um, so that's a breast board. Uh, and it literally are stirrups um, for your arms. So you get your head in that cup in the middle and you've got different arm positions. And so it's important that patients have good arm movements after they have their surgery. There's a little thing that goes under your butt there or your knees. Um, we use things like this, which are vac bags, which we suck air out of so that patients can be in position. And they, that remains in the same space. It's got um, sterile polystyrene beads in there and it stays solidified and then we use it for the patient, we clean it up, and then someone else can use it again. We put tattoos, you can't really see, it. there's a tiny dot there. So patients do get tattoos <coughs> in most departments, probably all departments in New Zealand, and they're real tattoos. <coughs> Excuse me. They're about a couple of millimeters in size, and for instance, in a breast, um, 
that we would give three tattoos, one down in the center between the, the breast low down and one in either sides of the lower parts of the armpits. Um, it, again, patients sometimes think that that's where the radiation is going through. It's not, it's just a setup point and there are lasers in the room um, to, to help positioning externally. This is what a head and neck mask looks like. So some patients may be claustrophobic and would like to know this, or um, you know, I, I suspect they might ask you what it's like or whether they're going to suffer with it. It's not like a plaster of Paris mask. It starts off as this piece of plastic with lots of holes, and that's how I describe it to a patient if I don't have one in front of me. And we warm it up in a warm water bath and it becomes flexible and we just flex it over a face. It just stretches over. And it takes about seven or eight minutes to solidify. And then that's the shell that we use for the rest of their treatment. And there are short versions like the one this lady's wearing up to her chin, and there are longer ones which just go up to about the level of the shoulders. So we don't use this for all other sites. We use it for head and neck, really because your neck is such a mobile area and it's so difficult to be pinpoint accurate in there. Um, it's easy for me to talk about this. I have to say that if I had this done to myself, um, it would be hard work probably. Um, there are some aids. So we do have things like lorazepam. We have intranasal fentanyl and all sorts of other things to um, relax patients if they need it. I will say that... Um, the vast majority get through this without needing anything. Maybe one in 15 to 20 might need a little help along the way, but they already knew that before they came to us. There you go, that's someone in a head and neck mask with the, some lasers to show us positioning. And we might, uh, these are some pictures just uh, to show what we might ask patients to fill up their bladder because it actually anatomically moves things out of the way, uh, like small bowel, for instance, if we're treating a prostate or cervix or something like that. And again, I'm not expecting you ever to have to look at these things, but we put radiation dose and there are beautiful colors that we can make it as rainbow as we like. Um, and as you can see on the picture on the left here, the, this is their heart, of course, and this is their breast. We've asked them to take a bit of a deeper breath in and we can make them move their heart out of the way when it used to be stuck against their chest wall. So there are different techniques. Now, um, I don't expect any GP and actually anyone outside of radiation oncology to really go into any detail with any of these patients. And I know that when our surgeons have, have done that in the past, I've had to slow them down a bit because sometimes patients come across and we have to unravel some of the expectations that aren't really true for that specific patient. Everything is so tailor-made. Um, and so I think it's useful for, for for you to know, to have a bit of a, um, a better understanding of what might happen for your patient, but always let them know that everything that we do is completely tailor-made to their cancer type, to their body shape, to their needs, to their morbidities. And uh, yeah, it's everything's thought about. And one, you know, breast patient, breast treatments are pro probably some of the easier things that we do, but one breast uh, treatment is, is very different to the other in, in many very small things here and there that we think about in our department. Um, this is like a snorkel, um, and this is actually our, our, if we're doing the breathing technique, um, the patients need to have a little snorkel in their mouth, and so they, they may not realize that, and it can be um, a little annoying for them when they, when they realize, but it just essentially picks up when they're breathing in and out. Right. When the scan is done, it comes to me as a radiation oncologist, and I do essentially adult coloring. Um, it's called contouring, uh, if we're trying to be technical, but I have a little pen there in the corner, and we have all the paintbrush tools like you do as any, um, I guess, artist would use, and these are touch screens, and so we can draw what, what we want to treat, which is good fun, so long as no one's calling you at the same time. And then it goes to, this is a team in the back and there might be a dozen or so radiation therapists, maybe more, who will take that plan and they would take that scan and they will make a radiation plan on their computer machine. And that information from that plan, once we've looked at it and said that looks good, and then all that information goes across to the machines. This is our um, linear accelerator three, this is our Versa. I've taken the picture uh, really because it's the prettiest one. It's got a nice blue light. Um, the, as you can see, this is where the radiation comes out of. The patient sit, lies down on a bed. It's a carbon fiber bed and it can move around. You can see the circle on there, it can move all the way around and it can move up and down probably four foot and four or five feet up and down. The machine can treat all the way underneath through the headboard and back around again. Um, yep, that's the machine behind the front end. So it's a, a bit uglier behind there. 
all right, we better get through this. Side effects. Um, I Googled radiation side effects, and this is what we had. Um, it's, it's, I can imagine it's quite horrendous when a patient Googles something. Um, so these are quite scary reactions for people to have. This is a head and neck one. Someone's been punched in the corner, in this corner, um, under there. Um, and then there are other things that are not related to radiation, of course, as Google picks up all sorts of things. Um, and I will say that those kind of skin reactions, let me go back. I mean, they do happen, but this is no longer, I mean, these are probably breast, these are breast treatments. This is not what a breast or chest wall treatment looks like now. Uh, I'd say that probably uh, uh, probably 70% of people will have lighter skin erythema ooh, to, to this by half at least. And no breakdown, and it's only the rare that gets patchy breakdown anymore. And some patients have no reaction at all, and that happens. They, they have no skin reaction that they perceive. Um, now, in head and neck realms, we do sometimes end up with this if we're treating through a lip. Um, those are hard treatments, but it is after many weeks of treatment rather than what they have all the way through. And it's not like they last like this forever. It's a few weeks that we support them through that. Um, so side effects. This is how I, I tell my trainees to learn the side effects, <clears throat> because when they try to learn a list, they always forget things and they don't know how to figure it out. So just think of radiation. There are two words here, inflammation and reduced function. <coughs> Excuse me. That's what radiation does as the radiation goes through tissues. Um, so if you're trying to figure out, is this a radiation reaction or not? It, it, the radiation works just where it goes. I think if it's somewhere else, then it's it's not my fault. OK, so if you say, oh, this patient now has diarrhea, but I treated his head and neck, um, you can call me up, but I'm just going to go, no, 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 it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Your problem. Um, I'll be nicer about it, but it's just not going to be. All, all of us know other pathologies that um, cause inflammation at different sites. So, you know, people get viral sore throats, you get uh, diarrhea, colitis, you get UTIs, um, um, yeah, you get uh, cellulitis. So you have, we, we all have pathologies that we all know about and have seen that causes inflammation. Essentially, radiation causes the same effect, essentially. So if we start in the CNS, um, so what would it do? I mean, like anywhere else, it causes inflammation. Um, and, and so you might get some headaches and nausea because we're swelling what's going on in there, maybe swelling some of the brain, maybe swelling the tumor a little bit before it responds. And so it might be putting a bit more pressure effects. And so DEX makes great sense in those moments to reduce that pressure. Makes complete sense. Um, reduce function, I guess, to the hair follicles that we go through. So radiation doesn't make your hair fall out unless we radiate your hair. <coughs> and so for a breast patient, I talk about hair loss. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. But you know, to, to an armpit, um, to for for a whole brain treatment, though, we're gonna we're gonna lose all of your hair on your head. Um for a head and neck, there are a lot more structures in there. So you're going to get inflammation. You're going to get a nasty sore throat like I have. Uh, far worse. Sorry, I should take that back. Far worse. Um, and it, it may reduce the function of your saliva glands that we're going through. So you get thick, tenacious saliva. It may, I guess, reduce the function of your swallowing through probably inflammation, actually, on that one of the muscles and pain. Um, <coughs> A breast and a chest. Well, a breast, a breast is 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 one of the simpler things that I do. Uh, in in many ways, the the, the the organ is is very much more external than most other things, and so we can avoid a lot of side effects for for breast treatments, other than the skin ones, I guess, which are not dramatic usually. If we're treating more in the chest, then we talk about esophagitis. You know, the same as if someone gets peptic ulcer disease and they get gastritis, exactly the same symptoms and sometimes the same treatments. I put someone on Losec or Mylanta or Gaviscon, all of those things might help. Um, and pain relief, of course. Um, in the lung, you'll get uh, inflammation. You might get pneumonitis and you can get pneumonitis for many other causes. Radiation manifests in the same way and it may be a dry cough or some shortness of breath, something like that. If you're doing abdomens and guts, it's like making your gut inflamed, you get nausea, uh, anorexia, diarrhea, particularly if you're hitting large bowel, um, and genitourinary. There you go, 10 minutes to go, gee. Um, 
maybe we have dysuria and frequency of urine, again, diarrhea, proctitis, colitis, all of these things. So just think about the tissues that we're going through. The skin, we have to go through the skin. So some of the skin will always get a bit pinky. If it's not the main target, for instance, in a skin cancer, it is the target. It is going to ulcerate because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give a good dose to the skin. If it's not the target and I'm treating um, a prostate, then you're going to get some pinky patches, but it's unlikely to really break down and cause you uh, crazy trouble. I'll be able to protect that. Um, that's probably all I'll say. Let's go quickly through these last bits. Kathy, is it okay to carry on or should I do some questions? Carry on? Okay. Um, Patients are seen daily. The, the benefit of having patients in the department for seven weeks is that every day we will see them, so they can't get away with falling apart. Um, uh, a radiation therapist will see them on treatment and they can escalate and nursing staff is there and they may see every day or weekly. Um, there's, for, for our breast patients at least, there's a skin care specialist or a radiation therapist that looks after their skin and they will tell them exactly what to do with it, what to put on it and what to do after they finish and who to call after they finish, which is us usually, and organized district nurses if required. We have our psychologists if we need it. And also, as you know, as soon as a patient has a diagnosis of uh, cancer, they're eligible to go to the Cancer Society and get loads of input, psychologists, social supports, um, uh, social interaction times, uh, uh, talking to people with other experiences, um, lots of avenues there. There are consultant reviews that happen, uh, particularly in head and neck, which is what I do, because again, they're the, the hardest uh, patient group. And dietitian, dental, speech and language therapists are, are also see our patients regularly. Um, we, when patients leave, they, we will call patients or get patients to call us until they're ready to go. We get district nurses if required. They're given the 0800 number from the day ward, which is manned or, or, or uh, manned by a nurse up there who's trained in triaging through problems and escalating to whoever it's needed. If they go through the ward, they get the ward number. They have you guys out there um, to, to interact between us if, you, if they need someone as an intermediary. If they're part of the hospice, they have that whole network as essentially a 24-hour service. And, at, and if they don't know anything else, they can come to the emergency department. So we do still get patients who say, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to call. And I'm really worried. And I don't know what. To... The honest truth is they have a million people. And it's sometimes just the communication of having someone to talk to. And we can always direct them. We don't mind them calling us if they don't know anywhere else. It's not a problem for us to direct them to the right place. And if we don't know what's going on, then we sometimes send them back to you as GPs if we think it's not related to um, oncology or side effects. And you're allowed to talk to us. So please call us if you think it's something related or you're not sure. We really want to know. And if neither of us knows, we send them to the, to the emergency department and they get sorted out if it's something that needs to be sorted out. Um, quickly, a lot of our patients do have hospice care. Um, I, I gather that a lot of particularly rural GPs that you might be actually looking after these patients as the palliative care liaison person. And so um, remember that the patient in some ways needs, needs to be well enough to benefit from the radiation, the actual, I didn't say that the effects, for instance, to let's say bone, which is probably our commonest malignant site that we treat in palliative setting, may take anything between one and six weeks for that benefit to really kick in. So if they're not gonna be alive in six weeks or a month, they're not gonna get that benefit. They'll come in, they'll get treated. They may, they may just end up dying in hospital because they just get unwell and too, too frail to get out again. And so if that's not their aim, it probably doesn't make sense to send them in at that point if they're that frail unless you're not sure what to do. Um, they need to be comfortable enough. So they have to lie on that carbon fiber table. Um, and some of these, and a lot of these have back vertebral mats and they can't lie still enough, comfortable enough for the time it takes for a scan. And that might be 15 minutes or treatment, which may be 15 minutes. Um, and so their analgesia needs to be just enough at least to be able to get them to lie down for that period of time. Um, it may be better that they go to the hospice for a while to have their meds optimized before they come to us from the hospice. Um, radiation is not a quick fix for these palliative care issues, particularly pain. Now, it might be a quicker fix for, say, bleeding, and it works quite well for that from other sites. I can do a whole lecture on palliative radiation oncology. Um, that would take an hour easily. Um, but yeah, uh, for, for, for something like bone pain, it may take a number of weeks. Um, your care with 
medication is always going to be important. The treatment I give might Im improve things from a quality of life perspective, but you'll probably still need to give those medications to make those patients feel better, even after I'm done. And then the goalposts change. As you know, something changes for the patient. They get better or probably worse. And then there's a different pain somewhere else, which needs to be optimized. We have long wait times because of our crazy amounts of, or lack of staff, I guess. Um, and so some of these patients are waiting 10 to 12 weeks to see us, which is horrendous. Um, our palliative patients, unfortunately, go down the triage list, which uh, is upsetting, although uh, has to happen for, for the curative patients. And it's, it's, it's the worst part of what we do is triaging these patients to a list where they may die before they ever see us. Um, and so... We're trying our best to obviously get through all of this. If, if you think that a patient really needs to be escalated, do talk to us. We're, there's someone always on call 24-7. Um, nice to call us in the normal hours, of course. Um, but let us know and, and we'll try and figure out how or whether we can help your patient. Um, we're always there to offer advice. We always are. Um, I'm going to skip maybe the head and neck ones maybe um i'm going to go to the questions that patients ask us um, because that might be more useful and then that is my final slide i'm sorry i pushed it okay um can you treat only once patients will say this is the last time i don't want to have treatment if this is the last time um so um as a very general term if we're doing a curative treatment to one side as a very general we usually say this is the last time we do it why um, because the tolerance of those tissues usually are used up by the first time that you push it to the limit. And the second time you come along, if you were to give a radical treatment or curative treatment to the same site, those tissues won't be able to withstand it. You just get more of the side effects before you get the benefit. Now, is it done? Yeah, it is. Actually, we treat like breasts a second time. The longer it's been since your last treatment, we can still kind of weigh up whether those tissues have recovered some tolerance. Sometimes they do, or they didn't have bad side effects the first time. And so uh, those tissues are still in reasonable quality and you can sometimes get away with it. But not to confuse people so that they don't know what they're doing. Just as a general term, we say if we do a curative treatment, that's usually a one-off course to that site. If there's palliative treatments to that site afterwards, that's usually possible because they're lower doses. And the aim of that is not to cure. Can I take my normal tablets during RT? Um, yes. Easy. Um, can I take vitamins and natural products with radiation? Um, the, 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 the safest thing that we would say, if you remember, I said that radiation makes free radicals in the tissues that then go and damage the DNA. Now, if you're taking things that are antioxidants, they theoretically can mop up those free radicals. So in theory, that doesn't make sense to do it. There are no studies that actually show that, that being an issue. Um, I have to say that it, it would be probably an unethical study, so we'll never get it, um, knowing that it, it, it has that um, uh, mechanism. Um, so I usually tell patients, I don't mind you taking these things till the day before you're having your treatment, so long as it's kind of cleared out of your system. It depends what it is, I guess. And start it the day after you finish. I don't really mind. Um, my expectation is that so long as it's not crazy intravenous vitamin C business, um, then it's going to be fine. If a patient says, no, 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 I must do it. I have no, I, I don't push too hard. I say, that's fine. This is this is what we know how it works. This is what we think it might do. I don't know exactly what the size of that effect might be. It's probably small. Go ahead and do what you're comfortable with. I'd rather they have the treatment than not. And some patients, it's sometimes a no deal if they don't have their their treatments or their tablets. Should I stop smoking? Yes, of course. Um, the radiation actually interacts with the smoking. Uh, and so it makes the, the side effects all worse, all in the short term and all in the long term. Um, so if they were to stop for those three weeks of their breast treatment, for instance, and then restart again after they finish, even though I don't want them to restart, that still makes sense uh, to do that. Um, it also reduces the eff efficacy of the benefit of what you're going to get from your radiation. So your outcomes are worse. So for many reasons, having radiation at the same time as um, radiation, smoking at the same time as radiation is a bad idea. Um, is vaping okay? I, I, just like all of you, I'm sure, they all feel that it's a lesser evil. Um, and so if that's what they have to do, that's what they have to do. 
can I take cannabis? Yes, again, I tell them not to smoke it. So um, for my head and neck patients who want to take cannabis, I'm like, you go ahead. But before you come to us, you experiment and you make your brownies and your cakes know what those are like and then once you come along don't smoke it while i'm trading through your oropharynx because that's going to be hideous but have your brownies and i'm fine with it um do i need histology no i can point my machine and treat anything i like um, um a medical oncologist that might be different or a hematologist because they need to choose their chemotherapy agents that are going to be most sensitive to that histology my radiation is going to kill whatever it goes past now different cancers do respond in different ways but the scenario where you don't have histology tends to be, well, it will be a palliative scenario. And in that circumstance, I don't need histology. It's nice to know what it is. There are occasional times that we have all been caught out where things look like cancers and they're not. And so we would always think that is the gold standard. But there are the odd scenarios where someone has, for instance, a cord, spinal cord compression and they're elderly and we don't have time to, to get the histology before we treat and we do that in those circumstances. Last two questions. Am I radioactive? No, you're not. I tell a patient um, the analogy that it's like standing out in the sun. The sun is radioactive, of course, and you get your damage on your skin from the sun. It's the same thing. The radiation happens in the machine. There are no radioactive parts in the machine, actually. Uh, some of the older machines used to have the radioactive beads, but the, the, the machine produces, it makes radiation, and then it's really the damage from that radiation that happens to the tissues you're never radioactive at any part of that. It's just like standing out in the sun. So there's no danger to elderly people, pets, pregnant people. You can do what you like. That is our standard treatment. Now, uh, don't be confused with uh, radioactive iodine, for instance, where you have a, a tablet or an infusion. They are radioactive for a while. Or um, sometimes there are treatments actually done in private, um, like prostate capsule or beads that are put into prostates. And those are little radioactive beads. And so you don't want your granddaughter to sit on your lap for three hours because you know she'll be gently radi radiated in that circumstance so there are some where we leave radiation brachytherapy it's called usually but the standard treatments certainly through Dunedin the only options that you have are external radiation and they are never radioactive last one what is the risk of second cancers that's again a longer question, but but the, the risk tends to be well less than 1% over your lifetime. And it takes more than five years, usually more than 10 to ever develop from the radiation that I give a patient. Uh, it's just within the area that I treat. That's what I tell a patient, for instance, when I do my breast patients, and when I do my breast patients. Um, now, the risk for breast cancer, particularly a breast cancer uh, as a second cancer, depends on the age of the patient and we have had data from the old lymphoma patients where we used to treat through the mediastinum and exponentially there's an increase in risk if you're below the age of 20 and then 30 and as you get into the 35s and 40s that risk is very small again but we as a consequence really do think about it hard when we get into that kind of range of patients for lymphomas um, in just about every other scenario, it's a no-brainer with the cancer that they've already had. The risks are far higher of that cancer ever causing them trouble in their lifetime than anything that I would give them. And that's how I put it to patients. If you just focus on the second cancer risk, it's scary. If you if you remind the patient they've just had a cancer or they have a cancer that is imminently going to kill them at some point, if we don't do anything about it, suddenly that, that risk pales in comparison. Uh, that's usually how I do it. Okay, I'm I'm done. Um, Kathy, is there anything? Wonderful, thank you very <laughs> that's much. That's okay. <laughs> You're right not on done the yet, I'm afraid. We've ah, that's okay. Go for it. Five questions. <laughs> oh, Jesus, go for it. Can Just I open that up? Just to entertain you. So, what we've got here is: How do you manage care of healed incisions when <laughs> the area being treated has been operated on often not long before? Yeah. So. If we radiate an area which hasn't completely healed, and so the effects are that that's going to take much longer to heal or it doesn't heal. So um, it's quite simple. We wait till it heals up. So, um, yeah, um, we have this from orthopedic surgeons and head and neck cancers and I guess breast surgeons as well. We make sure there's at least two to four weeks before we actually treat those patients. Um, and I would say that when we come and see them for the first time for their planning scan, I didn't give you any timelines, I'm sorry. We do that CT scan and it usually takes us between two and four weeks to actually treat the patient after that scan to do the planning. Um, so we kind of know on that first day whether they're gonna be ready in three weeks time 
sometimes we can delay that. Um, so yeah, we want things closed up. If they've had cellulitis, we want that cleared up before we start going. And that can be a delay on how we treat patients. I hope that answers it. Yep. So yeah. do, do you use silicone meplex to prevent radiation burns on chest, abdomen treatment? It makes a huge difference to prevent burns on the skin. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, Mepilex, we, we actually use a, a couple of, as I said, Verena would love this question, um, my nurse on here. Um, so yes, we do. We use the silicon um, dressings and we have the silicon cream, which has just jumped out of my head, which is essentially the same thing, but as a cream form, which um, which which um, costs a lot, but actually it, it, it it's a very small tube that works for a long period of time because you use such a small amount. And we find that we get a much better um, because particularly in the breast, you have so many curves and nooks and crannies in some patients that getting the film on it can be difficult, but the cream actually sits much better. So that's what we use for certainly the breast, not all sites. It depends on whether we are treating the skin surface. So for abdomens, usually it's not a skin of an abdomen that we treat. There are a lot of other internal organs that we treat. The, the skin is the least of our worries and usually the least of the patient's worries. Thank but you're you. right. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Completely funded for the patient. Do you have a preference for treatments of skin and mouth? Um, um, read that again to me. It's here somewhere, isn't it? Do, do you have, have a... a preference for treatments uh, of, of skin. skin and mouth? Do I so I'm wondering if that might oh, be yeah, yeah, about, yeah. Um, like side effects, you know, treatments for yeah. side effects from, yeah. Maybe, maybe, compared to, maybe compared to surgery, maybe? Is that what they're asking? A preference of treatment of skin, radiation to skin versus surgery? Do you have a preference for treatments of skin and mouth? Um, let me try and answer some something to do with that. And if, if, if I haven't answered it, um, Vivian, send me another message. Um, the, the skin, you know, skin cancers are the most common cancer by far. It probably dwarfs every other cancer by double. And when you look at cancer statistics, they take skin out of it because it, it's just it's impossible to count how many are out there so if we treated skin we can treat skin radically and we do treat, treat skin cancers radically and it works very well and i've had some patients who've come with me with a whole face of pre-invasive and invasive cancers that they've had cut by plastic surgeons and i'm friends with plastic surgeons of course uh, but multiple times 10 or 15 times and i've treated their whole face and they have thank me because all of those crusty things have fallen off their face. So it can work beautifully in some scenarios. The issue is that if all of you GPs refer to me for skin cancers, I, uh, our department will be swamped with only skin cancers in truth. Um, so what happens usually is that either you deal with it with some of your specialist skills, it goes to the ENT or the plastic surgeons, who will cut out simple things in simple places. But if there are places that either recur or are difficult to get good cosmesis, they will talk to us. And then we will discuss where the radiation is part of it. That's usually how it works. For oral cancers, I'm not sure when you meant mouth, whether you were talking oral cancer. So I do head and neck. And that is, there are so many parts to head and neck anatomy. So oral tongue and gum and lip and then oropharynx and tonsils and basal tongue. So each of those have different algorithms of whether surgery is part of it or radiation plus or minus chemo. And it depends on the site and the stage of that cancer and what we're trying to achieve with functional outcomes. So that's a real complex question, if that's what you were asking me. So what she was actually, it was about the side effects. Do you remember how you had your grandma Google slide and you had yes. the and you showed the one at the inside of the mouth? Oh, yes. It's a bit more common when you were treating yes. this one. She was yes. actually meaning about what treatments you would use to ah, treat okay. sort of those side effects. From oh, the yes. Rating. Okay. This is rough. Um, um, there is no simple way of doing that. If they have ulcers on their lips, you can use like Bongella type things or vitamin E or anything that's like a barrier cream we would use during the course of the treatment. And then after they finish, um, for, we give them, uh, it's called Kefazol mouthwashes. You could use so, um, salt after they finish. We give them a recipe for a very dilute um, salt water mouthwash. And that's usually a quarter teaspoon in a liter, I think. So it's extremely dilute. And then they gargle just a glass um, just to keep the debris and things like that clean. They're usually seen by the dental team. And so they'll get some advice on how to keep their teeth clean. And then after that, it's just simple analgesia until, not simple analgesia, 
uh, strong analogies here, until they're comfortable enough and, and those ulcers have healed up. So it's about just keeping things clean. Um, if, if it's ulcerated like that pitch of the gentleman with the mustache, um, they might not be able to eat and drink and that's fine. And so some of these patients will have a nasogastric tube that we give them milkshakes through. Um, that's the, the worst case scenario for most of them. And that will be like that at the end of our six or seven weeks of treatment for maybe two to three weeks. And in that time, at the end of that time, they'll be starting to eat and drink again. I hope that's answered it. Thank yeah, you. no, that's good. So yeah. it's in, there's another lady here saying, wonderful presentation. Oh, thank, thank you, you very you. much. You're my favourite, uh, Sierra. <laughs> it's just, I was wondering about fungating wounds, i.e. breath. Yep. Yeah. At what point should referral be made? When is it too early or too late? <coughs> so two things here, I guess, that bounce into my head. When you have a fungating breast tumour of a patient that we already knew had a cancer, um, I guess they would at that point already be in the system uh, under the breast surgeons or they've previously been seen by the breast surgeons. And usually they're a palliative patient at home or in their um, nursing home. And usually their management has already been kind of planned. And if it hasn't, then definitely just contact us and ask us what to do if you're not sure. But usually for those patients that have been in and through the system, there's already been a, a discussion about the ceiling of what can be achieved or done for the patient. Um, often or sometimes at least these patients have fungating tumors uh, are the ones that haven't been able to look after themselves and they may just not be well enough to be able to manage with staying still for our treatment. So that's right, demented patients, the patients who, who are too unwell uh, or confused, for instance, they can't have radiation, um, certainly not easily, and usually that's a contraindication because they just won't be safe to be in the room by themselves while that you know one-ton machine works around them at speed. So some patients just can't come in to the department. Now, the other group of patients that, that bounce in are the ones that you've never seen before and present to you for the first time with a fungating tumor. And um, that just needs to be urgently referred to the breast surgeon. Um, so the, the usual part for most of these cancers, I can't think of many that would come to us directly other than the palliative ones potentially, but all the other ones, if you're worried about it, needs to be referred to a surgeon of that site because they need to investigate and give us the histology and then bring it to an MDM to work out whether we're part of that treatment or not. So a fungating tumor, we may very well end up treating it as uh, with palliative reds, but you know, if they're well enough, they might get chemo to shrink it down and then they may look at doing a mastectomy and they may have a curative treatment, which would be really pushing the limits. They may have a toilet mastectomy to just clean things up for that patient because that's well, one session done and dusted and they're not well enough for radiation. So there are lots of different options for that kind of patient. Thank you. Um, is there any recommended support or suggestions for people struggling with sleep during treatment? Yeah, I suspect you might be able to help me with this as GPs, but um, my personal thoughts about sleep with oncology patients are like anything else, it's multifactorial. And I, I, I run through that with my patient and I say, I have to ask them, you know, what are the causes of that? Um, maybe I don't always start with the psychological aspect, but I know it's all it's there for most people. Um, so we go with symptoms to start with. And they, it may be that they're on medications that um, it may be that they have symptoms of their, their, their tumor. So they may have pain that's not controlled. And so I, I try to manage their symptoms of nausea. It may be that they're having side effects of their treatment uh, in the form of, say, if we're putting them on steroids, they're getting insomnia because of the DEX. That happens. We give DEX for everything. The chemo guys do the same thing. You know, DEX is the only drug essentially I use, um, along with the palliative ones. Um, and then it's the psychological aspects. And gee, you will definitely see it as rural GPs and staff. Uh, the, the rural population, uh, they have, if you ask them directly, they have no psychological issues, but um, actually they, they, they do, they just, they, they hide it well or they hold it back well and they don't want to trouble people and they're very, you know, humble and they just, they're like, oh no, no, I don't need that and I just want to get back home and I'm fine. But actually they do, they, they do tend to have a lot of psychological problems. And so we, we, we join them up with our psychologists if they allow us to. Um, if they don't, I try to give them as much information about um, sleep hygiene like you would do. Um, and then the very last resort is giving them sleeping tablets because I, I'm, I'm, I've never been a fan, even before being a, an oncologist, with sleeping tablets, unless it's a guided course where we're doing it to help them get into that pattern with their sleep regimen. Um, and then take them off it before it becomes a necessity. Um, 
but it's not easy. Thank you. Just one more question. When you provide radiation um, therapy, do you treat pain? Say, oh, when you provide your radiation to treat pain secondary to bone metastases, yes. how quickly should we be thinking about reducing opiate doses? Mm. That's a good point. Um, I, I would say that usually the pain doesn't rapidly fall off from a patient. So they're not usually caught off if they're, I, I think you're thinking about if they have morphine on board and suddenly they have no pain and they become knocked or they feel very drowsy on the side effects or something like that. Um, it, it usually doesn't happen like that. It's the, the, the differences don't happen over the over one day. It usually, usually happens over many days in the patient. We usually give them advice on how to titrate that for them. Most of my patients are on long acting and short acting, or maybe just short acting by itself, morphine. And so it self titrates. They're only taking it when their pain is getting over a certain amount of score, uh, pain score. And if they have less pain, they're taking it less frequently. And I usually tell a patient, you know, if you're taking it less than, uh, you know, if you're taking it only one or two times a day, that might be the time, that will be the time to reduce your long acting down a notch. If you want 20s, go down to 10s. If you're having it twice a day, then have it once a day and have your breakthrough there just in case. And then if you go, you know, if you're still only taking your PRN uh, morphine once or twice a day, then then get rid of all your long acting in the background and then you just have your PRN. And if the person is understanding the instructions, they shouldn't be taking that if they don't have any pain. They should already be on just paracetamol or something like that. Yeah, and just to acknowledge, we have had someone come on tonight who said they had radiation to the oh, upper yeah. lobe of their right lung almost 28 years ago. Ooh, well done. After being diagnosed terminal. I had ah, wow. with obviously miraculous results, but have damage yeah. to the brachial plexus. Oh, and I yeah. almost lost the use of my right hand, which yes. is still getting worse, but it saved my life and I would do the same again. There you go. And yeah. listen, the, the way we do our radiation now, so I've only seen a couple of people with that injury, and it was at the very start of my uh, career as a as a, a trainee. Um, the truth is, we do CT scans now to show us the dose going through 3D structures. Um, at the start of my career, whatever it was, 10 or 15 years ago, um, you know, so some still departments still doing two-dimensional planning. That means getting an X-ray. We all know what an X-ray looks like. It's just a bunch of bones. You don't see any soft tissues. And they take a, a piece of something called a china graph, which looks like a chalk and a ruler, and you draw where the radiation beams are going to go through. And so it was very hard. You're doing manual calculations, assuming that a patient is a, a, a water bath, because that's what you can experiment on with your machine. So you make a whole lot of assumptions back in the day of what are those doses going through those structures like a brachial plexus. And so I, in my working years, have never seen it uh, since we've been doing CT, you know, CT scans to plan our radiation because my planning uh, computer program tells me the dose that goes through there and if it's too hot, I can cool it off. But back in the day, we didn't have that. We did it, this is the standard, we drew it on, they set the patient up and they turn the machine on for the same amount of time with it's a patient who's half the size of you or not. And uh, we know that the radiation doses are different. Well, thank you very, very much. There's some good feedback coming in already about how informative your webinar has been and a great presentation. Oh, and because they, they do put the recording up later on mobile health and someone said out making sure they get their colleagues to watch it because they found it so informative and they think they need to see it too. You oh, have a good. range of people, hospitals, general practice, pharmacists, yeah, good range of people come on this evening to enjoy your presentation so thank you very Excellent. much for your time this evening thank you Wonderful. thank you for watching me that's great thank <laughs> you so much we'll do it again maybe of course <laughs> <laughs> give me some feedback as to what you want to hear so if people want to have some other things talked about the next time um, just let me know at any point that's fine that sounds like an offer we just can't refuse there. <laughs> Thank Brand. you. I don't know, Jess will be lingering somewhere there. She'll come in a second, I'm sure. <coughs> she'll be she'll be roaming around in the background. <laughs> Here she comes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you both very much, and we'll see you next time. That's Thank great. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.